Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad that you're here this morning. As we're getting started with our service together, one of the things that uh, we're gonna do today is we're gonna focus and read a few different Psalms that talk a little bit about worship. So let me invite us to worship together with this. It's from Psalm 95, and here's what it says. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock, under his care. Would you stand with us, and let's sing and worship together.
it's good to sing together. Would you have a seat as Mike comes and we hear some of our announcements? Good morning. Welcome. I'm Mike Swedeen. I'm one of the overseers here at the church. We welcome you all, those of you who are present here, those of you who are at home watching on live stream, or for those of you watching in uh, weeks to come as you catch up with the services. As always, we talk about Connect cards, these little green cards that are sitting in a folder in front of you in one of the pews. Sometimes I hear that they're right in front of you and I look and there's not one except down the hall. But what a great way to connect with the people down the pew from you or down the hall. Just reach over and say, hey, could you hand me one of those cards? I need to connect with you or I need to correct my information. I need to update it. I need to have something written on there. If you're watching online, there is a uh, link down at the bottom of the screen and there's also a link on the e-bulletin that you can uh, click on to update any information or to ask for information. Some exciting things coming up. On August 7th, 6 p.m., our VBS five-day clubs is starting at Renneke Park. Renneke Park is the park just south of the church. Not the church or the park that we did our worship in the park at, the one just south of the church. Kids will gather from around the community on the north side of that, or in the, at that park, and we've got volunteers set up, but if you're interested in helping, see our uh, child children's director, uh, Shannon, if you want to do any volunteering. But what we really want to have you consider is how, how you can go about inviting children in your neighborhood, your own family, anyone ages five years old through sixth grade. If you have anybody on your heart that you'd like to see come down and, and uh, be part of the good news, or hearing the good news of Jesus, have them come. There are cards that look a lot like this sitting on the connect table in the back. If you want information, you want to pass it on to your neighbors, pass it on to your children, grandchildren, a way to get to know what's going on. Speaking of kids, this fall the Good News Club is going to be starting again down at the public school. This is pretty exciting. Before 2016, this was a regular event, but it's coming back right now. God laid this ministry in the heart of Cindy Bulford. She's been working with local community ed, and she's going to be allowed to come into our school and bring Bible-based teaching to Malacca through, uh, right at the high school cafeteria. So God's opened the doors for us to go directly into the school and to the children. It'll happen each Tuesday beginning October 4th, and it'll go through May, finish out the school year available for all kids ages 5 through 12. The material is provided by Child Evangelism Fellowship, but we're looking for adults who'd be willing to help with games, snacks, memory verses, and sharing Bible stories. So begin to think of a way that you might become involved in reaching the kids of our community. There'll be training available in September for any adults who want to share with the kids from our community, so watch for more details. August starts tomorrow. August means men's retreat's coming soon, so the Rock Ridge Retreat up at Ely, Minnesota will be August 19th through 21. And you can register online through our website if you uh, feel the need to go. So men and boys, ladies and girls, you're left out. It's a guy's weekend. The guys cook, the guys clean, so that's, we don't need women there that weekend. Isn't that amazing? Mitch Vedders, one of the guys from our community, uh, will be one of our speakers. He and his father-in-law will be the presenters. So you don't want to miss what happens up there. It's a time where guys get to build into guys' lives, where we get to know the people that we sit in church with or their extended family. And then, as always, today at 5 o'clock, uh, we have our prayer meeting at the shed. So keep that in mind. Everyone's welcome. If you'd like to come and pray with us, we pray for about an hour. Short devotion. I think we're watching a video tonight and then a time of prayer. So with all that said, time to connect with the people sitting near you. So if you want to get up and greet each other, this is the time.
Well, it's time, you've already started taking your seats. I don't have to remind you. Uh, this morning we have a special, uh, special event. We welcome the Kasi family. They're our missionaries to Vienna, Austria. And they're going to be showing a short video and then coming up and, and giving us a presentation. So we'll be seeing a video on the screen. Hi, we're Brandon and Christy Kasi, serving in Vienna, Austria. We have three kids, Nikayla, age 20, Ethan, age 16, and Elena, age 14. And here in Vienna, our focus for our ministry has been on discipleship, on strengthening the body of Christ and multiplying ourselves for impact in the kingdom here in Austria. This past year, we've been involved in a Bible school that was recently launched by our local church called Living the Kingdom. Uh, we have been so thankful to be a part of teaching, of mentoring students, of providing pastoral care, leading small groups, just coming alongside the students and investing in their lives as they grow in Christ. We wanted to share one story with you. One of our students, her name is Ida. Ida comes from Iran, and she moved to Vienna when she was 15 years old. She comes from a family that doesn't know Jesus. She's the only one in her family that knows the Lord, and God has been working in her life in amazing ways. In this past year at the Bible school, we've had an opportunity to mentor her and to come alongside her as God has been growing her. We are so excited to see what he's doing in her life, and she's preparing to launch into ministry now as soon as Bible school is done. <laughs> and looking ahead to this next year, we're going to continue to be involved at the Bible school. Uh, but we've also been asked by our church to launch a new marriage ministry this fall, where we will be leading marriage seminars, talking about how to have a godly marriage that's founded in Christ and on the Word, and also uh, expecting that that's going to lead into small groups with couples to talk uh, more personally about how to live that out. We've been so thankful this past year to be involved in the lives of Patrick and Louisa. This is a couple that we met at church. Uh, before they were married, and they asked us to do their premarital counseling for them, which was a huge privilege for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has actually led into continuing to mentor them even now after they've been married. Uh, we just have a huge passion for godly marriages uh, and an excitement to spread that uh, passion for Christ for others. Mm -hmm. A few ways that you could pray for us. Um, one is please pray for our family, that we would continue to grow in our walk with God and that we would be a light to the people that God brings our way. Um, also, please pray for Brandon and I as we continue serving at the Bible School. We will be launching into our second year of working with students, and we're really excited about that. So please pray that we would be a blessing to those students and that they would grow in their walk. Pray for us, too, as we begin the marriage ministry, that God would give us the right couples to reach out to and that they would grow in their marriages. And finally, we would ask for prayer for our finances. We are at about 90% of our monthly need, and we just need God to provide more partners who will have a burden for Austria along with us um, and have a joy in serving alongside us financially and through prayer. Thank you so much for all of your encouragement, your prayers. Um, thank you for coming alongside us and partnering in this ministry. We couldn't be here without you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Yeah, so good morning. Thank you so much for being part of this journey with us. Three years flies by. I feel like I reconnect with people that we saw when we left, and it feels like we were just here. Some of you that have come in the last few years, you don't know us personally. Uh, we look back on the last three years, and we think, wow, it feels like it flew by, but at the same time, a lot has happened. A lot has happened here in the States, and a lot has happened in our lives. Uh, actually, today is the three-year anniversary. We set foot in Austria three years ago today. Uh, so we're thankful to come back feeling like the Lord has opened doors for ministry for us there. Uh, we give him the glory and the praise that he is choosing to uh, put our willingness to serve to use there. Um, so again, Brandon and Christy Kasi, our kids, Nikayla is 20, Ethan is 16, and Elena at the end is 14. I do want to mention Nikayla is actually becoming the third generation missionary to Austria uh, Christy's folks were missionaries in Austria, were there, and now she wants to launch out on her own, and she's raising support to do work at this Bible school also with us, and she's moving on to uh, life as an adult in Vienna, Austria. Uh, we're going to share a lot more during the, the luncheon after the service, uh, talking about what we're doing in Austria, what the past few years have been like, and what's ahead for us. So please, if you can, stick around and come hear more there. Uh, during the, the prayer requests that we shared in the video, I just want to add one thing. Just please pray for revival in Austria. We said this when we were here three years ago, and it's still true. Less than 1% of Austrians would identify as being evangelical believers in Christ. 
the 99% of a population that wouldn't say they know Jesus as Lord. It's hard for us to fathom that. We feel like our culture is struggling, but Austria is very lost. So please pray for revival. Pray for the Holy Spirit to work in hearts to draw people to himself. We're there to be a light. We're there to do our part, but we can't do that, that part of illuminating blind eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for having us back. It's been such a joy to see all of you again after three, three, four years. Um, and we are so grateful for your partnership in our ministry, both through prayer, but your finances, and just for investing in our family with encouragement. Um, we can't thank you enough. And we hope to get to connect with some of you over lunch. Um, if you can stay, we, like Brandon said, we'd love to share more with you about what God's been doing the past three years, but what he's going to be doing in these next years as we move forward in ministry. And on top of that, Nikayla will be sharing a little bit more about her story as well, and you don't want to miss that. It's really fun to hear what God's been doing in her life. So thank you again for having us, and we hope to connect with you after church. As the ushers come forward to take our morning offering, we're just going to go to prayer here. Father God, we thank you for the Kasi family. And Lord, we pray with them for revival in Austria and Vienna. We just ask that your spirit would move, that we'd, you would draw people unto yourself. We pray too for this next year of Bible school, that they'd be able to connect with the students. Pray for wisdom for them as they begin this marriage ministry. And we pray for Nikayla as she moves towards her own mission ministry. Lord, we celebrate the great things that you're doing in this body, but we also mourn with the Gilbert and the DeRozier family as they process the loss of Grace and Butch. And we know, Lord, the, of the hope that, uh, that is there with, with us, that we know that we'll be reunited with them at one day, in one day. Father, we pray that you'd use this offering, that you'd bless this offering, that you'd use it to uh, build your kingdom both here and around the world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have our time of offering, we're going to read a couple psalms um, that are right next to and related to what we opened with this morning. We're going to start with Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And then this is from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Claim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Would you stand and sing with us as we respond together? sing King of My Heart. Let the King of My Heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. my 
Let's go just our voices one last time. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. a beautiful day this morning, and I am pleased to be with your, you here today and to see all of you here. Um, we have some good stuff that we're going to go through today from the Gospel of John as we continue to move through that book. As you know, there's a lot of uh, great things that are coming in the fall. Uh, I'm really uh, praying that uh, God works through these uh, different ministry initiatives to just extend and expand uh, his rule and reign, his kingdom in your own heart and life, uh, in the corporate life of our church and in this community. Lots of things to pray about. We had a great annual or semi-annual meeting uh, last Sunday, lots of ministry initiatives to be in prayer for. So I hope that you'll be able to come out later today and uh, just join in prayer with God's people as well as uh, spending some time with the Cossies today at lunch and uh, learning uh, what God is doing overseas in a place like Europe. So as we turn our attention back to the Gospel of John, you'll remember the section that we're in is such a powerful section of Scripture. It starts out with the miracle that you're so familiar with now because we've talked about it so many times, this wedding at Cana, which is highly symbolic for Jesus' ministry, if, if you remove this aspect of it being sort of a foreshadowing of what Jesus' ministry is all about, all you end up with is kind of an odd uh, miracle or odd event that deals with alcohol at a wedding. But when you understand that, that what's really happening there is, is John, who witnessed this, is saying, uh, Jesus came literally 
uh, to transform that which is common and dirty in our hearts, as that water was that we talked about that was used for ritual purification, he comes to transform that which is common and dirty into something choice and something which is after his nature and the nature of the Father. It's, it's, it's a miracle of transformation. That's how it starts. And then we're introduced uh, to a man that transformation doesn't happen for. It, it's really fascinating. Uh, Nicodemus, as we read in John chapter 3, uh, a man who was part of the religious elite and the wealthy and powerful in Israel and uh, meets with Jesus and Jesus right away cuts to the chase and says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. This man had knowledge, wealth, influence, respect, status, leadership, and great obedience to the law, and yet he wasn't saved. None of that gave him salvation and none of that produced peace in his heart. And Jesus says it's not outward, it's something that has to be inward. And then we saw this played out in a radical way in John chapter 4, the, the largest part of John 4 that we looked at a few weeks back, where we looked at the woman of the well, and we talked about how that's really contrastive. Like on one hand, you have this Jewish member of the religious establishment and power elite and, and John has Jesus moving from there directly into Samaria. And as he's in Samaria, he meets with this woman at the well, who you remember is there at the middle of the day. She's there at the middle of the day because she's avoiding people. There's some heavy sin that, that she's involved with and has been involved with for a long time. And as she begins to interact with Jesus, she changes. And suddenly this gal who is hiding out at the well because she's ashamed of what's happened in her life, it becomes so attached to Jesus and comes to him in that saving way so, so that that shame is removed from her sin. And she actually goes and talks to people and invites them to come and meet and talk with Jesus on the basis of the thing that she was ashamed about, on the basis of her sin. So this like great revival breaks out in Samaria, probably the last place that Jews would expect to find it. And so that brings us to today, and we're going to close out John chapter 4 today with the, with the passage I think that's fairly straightforward, which is not certainly all the, always the case in, in the Gospel of John. And yet it still has this kind of theme that, that runs through it. Again, you know, you start with Nicodemus, who's part of the, the religious power elite, and then you go to the Samaritan woman, a, an outcast woman from an outcast group of people, and a revival starts there. And now he's going to kind of tie it up as uh, Jesus, now having finished off in uh, Samaria, heads back to Galilee. And as he's in Galilee, uh, he interacts with somebody who's part of the political elite, uh, the political power establishment. And again, the point is, I think, kind of underlining the statement that was the last one that we find in the story of the Samaritan woman, which is in John 4, 42. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. And that is a huge statement. Because again, it's not this issue of ethnicity, education, socioeconomic status, or morality, but faith in Jesus Christ that brings us into that saving relationship with God. Now, as we begin to, to look at this particular section, I, I just want to introduce it with a, a little bit of a quote from a book that's kind of old, but I think it summarizes where we're at even today as a culture in America, and specifically in churches in America, it's from uh, Jesus, Mean and Wild by Mark Golley. And in his book, he includes an interview with Stephen Prothero, and this is all the way back in 1994. And during that interview, Prothero said, Christians traditionally, as they've shaped Jesus, and that's an interesting statement, have been worried about getting it wrong, including the Puritans. Americans today are not so worried there isn't the sense that this is a life and death matter. In other words, it's not life and death to get Jesus wrong. That you don't want to mess with divinity. There is a freedom and even a playfulness that Americans have with Jesus. 
The flexibility that our American Jesus exhibits is unprecedented. There's a Gumby-like quality to Jesus in the United States, even turning Jesus into a friend among born-again Christians. That kind of chutzpah is something that was unknown even to Americans in the colonial period. Now, here's why I, I share this with you guys. It's not surprising. I think there's something within us that always wants to mold Jesus into something that we're more comfortable with, or maybe something or someone that we can worship more easily in some ways, because he works on our terms, taking care of the needs and desires and issues that we think are important. And I mean, we can see this as we look at, at religion in America and, and, and kind of this, this desire to mold him again into something more acceptable. The, the, the prosperity, health and wealth gospel has been out there for, for years and years. You know, today we're seeing in some sections a focus on Christian nationalism and, and then there's, you know, this, this progressive Christianity that's so focused on, on social issues and kind of an odd gospel that comes out of that. And, and all this is an attempt to just kind of shape Jesus into something that uh, we're comfortable with that's not necessarily who he is at all. And see, the issue is, this isn't anything new. This has been going on for 2,000 years, and this is one of the things that we're going to see today. And actually, this is a theme that, that runs not only through this section of John, but all the way through John 6. And see, the, the problem that when, when we try to mold Jesus in, into something other than, than what he is, is, is the gospel can become cloudy. The gospel can become fogged. And, and what's really probably going on and driving that is a certain amount of idolatry in our hearts as we make him into something that he isn't. It's really important to get who Jesus is right because all of eternity hangs on that question. Not only that, but, but finding a good and satisfying and healthy walk with him turns on that question as well of getting Jesus right. And so that's really what this passage is about. This is about getting Jesus right. This is how Jesus uh, begins to confront this culture that he's a part of that's already molding him in a certain direction and kind of begins to, to attack that and address that and move this into a healthy place so that we can really understand exactly who he is and what he's all about. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and read through this, this passage. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward. It's a passage about faith. John 4, 43, and after the two days, so he spent a couple of days in Samaria, he went forth from there into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. He came therefore again to Cain of Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was requesting him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus therefore said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he started off. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour that he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed and his whole household. And this is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So... Not surprisingly, for many of us, you go through life and you understand that even if you're a believer, that does not deliver you from pain and suffering. Pain and suffering is part of our human experience. <clears throat> so this particular section starts out with a crisis, a crisis. God is an expert at using personal pain for his purposes. I, as I read through this section, was reminded of a very good friend of mine years ago 
uh, when we first met, actually, in the first church that I was in, and this is in the early 90s, mid-90s, and this guy, just this kind of a large guy, really great guy, but kind of tagged along with his wife, and his wife was, was pretty uh, involved in the church, and his wife was pretty concerned about spiritual things, and he was just kind of present to make her happy. That's just how it was going along, until she got really sick one day. And then he started to change, and then the light started to come on for him. And I remember later when he came to me and, and he said, you know, God has just worked through your ministry to bring such a change in my life. And I said, what in the world makes you think I had anything to do with that, man? I mean, that this was this crisis situation, and, and God used that to draw you close to himself. And I mean, now this guy is just a leader in the, in the church. He's the, the chairman of their elders. He's on social media all the time, posting stuff about God. He teaches consistently in the church. But see, that's what happens. God will leverage issues of personal crisis and pain to do his work in people's lives. And so you have this going on here. A little bit of background, though, before we get there, because we find this in this passage, and we've already read this. So he splits out of Samaria, and he goes to Galilee, and that was why he went through Samaria in the first place. Remember, he's on his way north, goes through that area. It's the most direct route. The most devout Jews would not go there. But then it says this in verse 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. And we're going to understand a little bit more about what that means in a minute. But, but his point is, this revival breaks out among the Samaritans when really all Jesus does is, is have a bit of a, a prophetic insight into the sin issue of, of this, this woman in, in this area of her life. And that's it. But when he's among the Jews, the Jews kind of demand these miraculous signs. It's like, listen, we'll follow you, but you got to hit us with fireworks, Okay. So th that's what he's saying, basically. John is saying, he's like, Jesus is honored among the Samaritans, but not so much the Jews. So we continue on. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. Received him. Now, now this means that they, they honored him. They were excited that he had come home. But, but what was the basis of this? Having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. So to understand what's going on here, you have to go to the end of John chapter 2. Way back in history, we were at the end of John chapter 2, and we touched on this briefly. And you see this in verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the Passover feast, many believed in his name, beholding the signs in which he was doing. So, Jesus is performing signs. People are like, yes, we believe in you and everything that, that you're claiming. But then you have this statement in verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, wasn't entrusting himself to them because he knew all men. In other words, they believed in him, sort of, but he really didn't believe in their belief. Verse 25, because he didn't need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. That's a pretty strong statement. Basically what it's saying is this. They had a faith in Jesus. They had a faith in him. They had a belief in him that was sincere. And, and the sincere faith, the sincere belief they had in him was Jesus as a miracle worker. Not Jesus as Savior, not Jesus as Lord, not one that, that you bow to, not one that you can submit to or should submit to, but one who is a miracle worker. That's where it stopped. And, and there is a bit of a warning here in the sense that you can believe in Jesus but not be saved. You understand that? You can have a kind of faith that is not a saving faith. That's this passage. This is where Nicodemus starts. Notice what this says in chapter 3, verse 1, because this picks up directly from chapter 2, what we just read. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. When we talked all about Nicodemus, this man came to him by night and said to him, what? Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Not Savior, not Lord, but what? Teacher. And how do I, as Nicodemus, how do I make that assessment? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You're a miracle worker. That's my level of faith in you. Something is going on with you that I can't understand, so I believe that you are 
a miracle worker. So these Galileans come to him, and they are expressing faith in him as a miracle worker. We are so glad that this great miracle worker and healer and whatever else have you is among our midst again. And by the way, again, you know what's coming in John 6. This is when he feeds the 5,000. We're actually going to even touch on that a little bit today. And the majority of people that witness that miracle end up turning away from him because they don't like the teaching that's attached to the miracle, right? Like, and, and I use this because it's, it's, I don't know, kind of the largest and, and somewhat nastiest fast food place. But you've heard me talk about Taco Bell before, right? People make jokes about Taco Bell. I'm not here trying to throw Taco Bell on the bus. It is what it is. But these people, right, they're like, hey, I am going to be with you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you because I've got you pressed into this mold and you've already fed me physically. And this is what Moses did in the wilderness, God working through him. He, he fed us in the wilderness. So, man, I am your follower as long as you Taco Bell me every day, three meals a day. Let's go. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. What are you talking about? Adios. So there is a faith that's here, but it's not saving faith. And it's very critical to understand this. If you're going to understand this passage, and we're really going to dig into it. So here we go. So they received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also were at the feast. So these Galileans, being good Jews, had come down to the feast. They witnessed all these things that, that he's done. They're like, yay, here we go. The local boy who's a miracle worker is back home. He came therefore again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water to wine. And we talked about the specific function of that miracle in the Gospel of John. It was not a small thing. And there was a certain royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, this royal official would have been an administrator of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, uh, also known as Herod the Tetrarch, is the son of Herod the Great. We, we need to sort this out a little bit. Herod the Great was not a nice guy, right? Herod the, the Great, the Great, was the one who had essentially uh, butchered the children in an attempt to, to kill Jesus, okay? So th this is this guy's son, uh, the son of the child killer. He was the Roman appointed governor of Galilee, but again, was probably viewed as being royal because of his connection with his dad. He was a prince, so he was looked upon as royalty. And he was an evil man. He had a relationship with the wife of his half-brother, and that was Herodias. Uh, he imprisoned John the Baptist when John the Baptist confronted him about his lifestyle and, and publicized him critically or publicly. Uh, he... Uh, beheaded John the Baptist when his stepdaughter danced for him and made that request. He threatened to have Jesus killed, we see that in the Gospel of Matthew, and was directly involved in the crucifixion, not only in the sense of interviewing Jesus and, and mocking him at one point, but I think also in like Acts chapter 4, something like that, uh, he's mentioned as someone who was actually plotting against Jesus. Now, this is the man that this official worked for. And by the way, uh, it was pretty common at this time for you to appoint family members to be a part of your administration. That's just kind of the way things were done. It was a way of, of giving them favors. It was a way of kind of enriching them, providing some kind of security for them. Uh, so th this guy may not just be a highly placed and paid administrator. He may actually be a part of this family. It would, again, make them wealthy and secure. So again, we have this crisis. He came, therefore, again to Cain of Galilee, where he made the water into wine. And there's a certain royal official there whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was requesting him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. You know, sometimes when you read this stuff in the English, the, the intensity just doesn't come through. Uh, in, in the Greek, what we see is this powerful man is desperate. I mean, the verb tense tells us he is literally begging Jesus to come and heal his son. 
Now we know this, and yet it's a good reminder that wealth, power, and privilege do not insulate anyone from the pain of life. This guy is experiencing acute pain. A powerful man has been reduced to begging the local carpenter who also happens to be a miracle worker. And this is not a minor thing, what we see. His son was at the point of death. There is little in this world, as I know so many of you know, that is more painful than the suffering of our children. There is little in this world that is more heartbreaking, more agonizing, more difficult for for us as parents than, than the suffering of our children. I know with some of what you've gone through, I know your stories, and I know some of my own stories, and, and it's tough. And, and I mean, this is literally life or death. This guy is panicked. And I was trying to remember even a point in my own life where I would have felt just panic like this. And I just located my wife, Kim, up there in, in the balcony. And Kim, do you remember when one of our kids uh, wandered away from us at SeaWorld on a really busy day? Holy cow. Holy cow. And I mean, it took us a while to find that child. Panic. And I don't even think that, you know, that was serious panic, but I don't even think that approaches the panic that this guy would have in an era where there's no modern medicine. Parents are so heavily invested in their children. That's just one of the ways that that God hardwires us as people. And when our children suffer, it's just a, a horrible experience. So this guy, this man is desperate. None of his power, none of his wealth, none of his influence can save him. And so he goes and begs the local carpenter. Life this side of of heaven is painful, but God is an expert at using that anxiety, that stress, and that grief for his purposes. You know, for those of you that are going through stuff, I don't know what he's doing. I wish I could tell you. I would be a bad God if I had it in my power. I'd make it stop. But for whatever reason, he uses these things for his glory and for his purposes in our hearts and our lives. We're about to see how Jesus turns this man's pain and suffering into an opportunity to teach and bless and enshrines this in God's word, which is going to last forever. But the way he does this is, is difficult. I, it's, it's, if you understand what's going on, I mean, especially at first, this is hard to read because he moves from the crisis directly to a test. He gives this guy a pretty hard test. This is where the difficulty comes in, I think. Jesus, the great healer, great miracle worker, is about to act in a manner that is contrary to the expectations of the royal official. When we see what Jesus is about to do, quite frankly, it is quite possible that this man may be insulted, offended, and walk away from Jesus. Imagine it this way, because this is about what you're, this is about, you're about to see. You have a child that, that's very critically ill. Critically ill. After waiting months and months and months with this critically ill child, you're finally able to get in and see a doctor who is the world-renowned specialist at dealing with this type of illness in your child. You explain the situation, and the doctor says, you know what, I don't, I don't have time to see your kid. Sorry about that. Here's all I need to do. Go feed him like uh, a pound of uh, raw hamburger a day for two weeks and he'll be fine. That's what you got for me? How's that going to take care of anything? Well, that's a test, right? That, that kind of causes you to think, maybe ca- causes you to question the authority and expertise of the doctor. And you got a choice right then and there. What am I going to follow? Who am I going to follow? That's a tough thing. Let's hop into this a little bit. So here's Jesus' response in verse 48. Jesus therefore said to him. Now now he says this to him, but he's talking to a lot of people. Uh, He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. In the Greek, that's plural. It's not you, it's y'all. 
He's addressing this entire audience and actually all the people of Canaan. What he's saying is, I don't know what it is with you guys. You have hard hearts unless you people see signs and wonders. You refuse to believe. This is potentially somewhat off-putting. This guy could have been insulted. Here's how he responds. The royal official said to him, again, just keeps it up, Sir, come down before my child dies. Two things happen here in the Greek that don't really come across in the English. Uh, he, he changes his wording from the previous verse. He doesn't say, uh, my child, actually here in verse 50, he says, come down before my little boy. My little boy. This is intensely personal. And then when he says, come down before my little boy dies, uh, what he's saying is th- this is absolutely going to happen. No question about it. Th- this is an imminent event. This is going to take place. This is going to go down. This is going to be ugly. This is going to be painful. Now, this is really deep, and this is actually where things are somewhat symbolic in this particular passage because we run into this a lot with John. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Now, you might think that's reassuring. What did the guy ask? What, what was his question for Jesus? It wasn't just heal my son. It was come down with me, come to my place. Jesus said, I'm not going to go. I can take care of it. What does he have at that point? I actually have this underlined in my Bible. If you want to underline it as well, that's pretty huge for me, and maybe it will be for you too. Again, first part of verse 50, Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he started off. God puts his people to the test. Are you going to have faith? Are you going to bow the knee? What's it going to take? You mentioned John 6. Actually, this happens a couple times in, in John 6. There's this issue of testing the disciples to build faith. John 6, 1, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias, and a great multitude was following him because they were seeing the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And Jesus went up to the mountains, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a great multitude was coming to him, fed them, right? No. Here's an opportunity. He said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread that all these may eat? What is that? Isn't the word in German, prüfung, is that it? Pretty close? I still remember some German. It's test, right? You say, where do you get that? Verse 6. And this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. A little later on in uh, verse 16, he puts him in a boat where it's kind of stormy. It's a test. You're going to have faith in me and my character and my promises and my salvation. See, guys, at the end of the day, what do we ultimately have to trust in? What are we ultimately called to place our faith and trust in? Jesus Christ, his person and work, through what? His promises that are found where? In the Word. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it men of old gate approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. And here we go. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And when he was not found, because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, 
number one, and number two, that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned about the things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. What did he have? The call of God, the promise of God, and he had to exercise faith. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for the city which, was, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life. She considered him faithful who had promised the promise of God, the word of God. Therefore also there were many born of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars in, of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own and they indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And it goes on and on and on. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he started off. What promises has God made to you? What type of faith are you willing to exercise? Are you willing to follow God, follow Jesus Christ, and, and be okay with things when he does things that are contrary to your expectations? This is counterintuitive stuff. It's difficult. This man exercises faith. Here's what happens in verse 51. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So they inquired of them the hour in which he began to get better. And they said, therefore, to him yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And then you get this intensive pronoun. He himself believed in his whole household. What this means is he exercised faith, he stepped out in faith, and somehow, we don't know exactly how, he ended up exercising ultimate saving faith in Jesus. Jesus brought him to that point. This is, again, a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. A couple of thoughts about this in this section uh, I think the word believe is used three times. It's used, as you know, as we talked about this, somewhere around 100 times in the Gospel of John. That's about half the times in the New Testament. It, it doesn't, as you know, refer to this intellectual assent to facts. It refers to trust. Placing your trust and your confidence in the Word of God. Placing your trust and your confidence in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Something else, three times this passage says living in life and what John wants us to understand is that believing in Jesus Christ, placing your faith and trust in him, putting all your eggs in that basket, ultimately results in life. Now, physical life here, but obviously John is using this to point towards eternal life. Test produces saving faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have his word. We have his promises. Do you have faith? Are you fully trusting in him? Here's the big idea, and I want to focus on, on one thing. This is important. This is John 1.14, but as many received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. Believing in his name means belief, full and, and complete belief 
in all of his aspects. It, it means, it's funny, even though it says in John 2, these people were believing in his name, they really weren't. They were trying to mold him into their image. But believing in his name means exercising faith on his terms, not my terms. It means calling him Lord and actually acknowledging him as that in my life, not just saying the words. Again, the theme that runs throughout the Gospel of John. You have his word, you have his promises. Do you have faith? Let's pray together. Lord, this is a simple passage and a powerful passage and a great exhortation to come to you in faith. And God, I would uh, just this morning want to lift up anyone who is here who has not come to you and truly just recognize you as their Savior and Lord and truly bow the knee of their heart to you. Father, we ask that you would impress upon their hearts to do that this morning. And, and Lord, uh, um, we would also lift up any who may have just wandered from you. Maybe they're on a bit of a vacation for whatever reason. And they've had this relationship with you, but, but they're kind of just off somewhere. God, we ask that, that you would work in their hearts to just bring them back into this close, tight, personal relationship with you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises, God. And uh, Father, I ask that you would all just cause us to exercise uh, deeper and more perfect faith in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's close and sing together. Um, Amazing Grace, would you stand with us? And we'll finish with some worship. me.
to that day when what we just sang about happens when <laughs> the new heavens and the new earth come and things are made new and God who's called to us will be forever dwelling with us and we will be his people so go in the hope of that this week and have a great week serving the Lord you're dismissed <laughs>